Long ago, in the distant year of 2002, a trading card game called Yu-Gi-Oh! made its way to North America and Europe. You may have heard of it, maybe not, or maybe you play it all the time. This small card game from Japan would eventually grow into a global phenomenon with huge tournaments and thousands of cards. However, amongst these early months of the game, there was none of the complexity of combos or deck types that would appear later. Instead, there was but one deck that dominated the face of the game. Since I have covered many of the more competitive heavy formats, I thought it would be fun to talk about what Yu-Gi-Oh! was like when it first came to the states in Europe. With that being said, my name is Avery, and this is a 2002 Yu-Gi-Oh! beatdown format retrospective. Pegasus, I pulled the weekdays card! What? That's right, now I can battle with my monsters every Monday through Friday! This is it, Yu-Gi! Great move! You can win this! Go, Yu-Gi! Attack! Now, Monday through Friday at 3.30 on Kids WB. It's important to note that at this point, the game's primary audience was younger children who watched the TV show. The issue here comes from the fact that the show at this point did not follow the actual rules of the real-life game. I think anyone who watched the Duelist Kingdom series of Yu-Gi-Oh! knows that for a fact. Meaning, a large portion of the game's target audience would play the game without properly understanding the rules, limiting the competitive player base of the game. It is also important to remember that there was little to no online community for the game in these early days, as well as no tournaments bigger than those held at local shops. Keep in mind that this was 2002. YouTube wasn't a thing. The online community really wasn't a huge thing at this point. There wasn't SJCs or YCS tournaments, no nationals. It was just on the local level at the time. And because of this unstructured and immature form the TCG was in for the first year or so of its existence, the most common strategy tended to be jamming 40 to 50 cards of the best cards that a duelist had into their deck and using that to compete. This was facilitated by the fact that the card pool of the early game consisted of only two starter decks and one regular booster set, that being Legend of Blue-Eyes White Dragon, made up of near useless monsters. While the card pool from these two releases was mostly unusable, it still gave the game a handful of powerful cards. These few useful cards would go on to form the backbone of the early competitive game. The core strategy of a beatdown deck was extremely simple. Beat down the opponent's life points with powerful monsters until you win. It was to this end that the deck, especially early on, focused on utilizing the strongest and most easily summonable monsters available at the time. This focus gave rise to the earliest competitive form of beatdown, that being Summon Skull Beatdown. This deck focused on using its namesake card, the strongest one tribute monster in the game at the time, to create a powerful field presence. This was then combined with a variety of high attack monsters that could be summoned without tributing. The original attack cap for these monsters without having some kind of drawback was 1800, seen in La Jin, Mystical Genie of the Lamp, out of Starter Deck Kaiba, and Seven Colored fish which was out of metal raiders la jin was however rapidly beaten out by a monster with 1850 attack called mechanical chaser but this card was an ultra rare from the first tournament pack which was a booster of three cards only distributed by official tournament stores and was therefore difficult for the majority of players to get their hands on think of tournament pack cards like your normal ots packs that you see today Beyond these powerful normal monsters, the rest of a beatdown deck consisted of the various staple cards that a player had, a pool which expanded rapidly with every release in 2002. The only truly staple effect monsters at the time were Maneater Bug and Wall of Illusion, cards that, while outclassed within a few years, were truly formidable in this early game. The other core staples used by the deck after the first month of the game were primarily the five classic power staple spell cards, Pot of Greed, Monster Reborn, Raigeki, Dark Hole, and Change of Heart. All these cards, excluding Dark Hole, shared the common feature of granting their user a significant advantage with no actual cost to the player. The sheer power of these cards caused the creation of the first ever limited list, restricting their usage in any given deck to one. Unlike today's forbidden and limited list, the original limited list only restricted cards to be run in one or two copies in a deck, but did not forbid the usage of any cards. The trend at the time was for a new list to usually be released around a month after the release of a major set so as to restrict all of the major major power staples that were coming out in every new set at the time, soon after they entered the game. Other common cards included Trap Hole and Fisher, which both allowed for easy single monster removal, as well as Wabaku, which is one of the best traps available out of the extremely small pool of traps that existed at the time. Wabaku, for those who used it, was an extremely potent card, blocking all damage for a turn in a format where the only thing Dex wanted to do was as much damage as possible. Swords of Revealing Light was also an extremely powerful card for those who could get their hands on it, as spell and trap destruction was largely unheard of at this point, making it a very difficult card to get past. 
The advent of the second booster set, Metal Raiders, added several effect monsters to the pool of good and usable cards. These monsters mainly included Witch of the Black Forest, Sangin, and Magician of Faith. Witch of the Black Forest and Sangin were the first searchers ever released in the game, being able to both cover almost the entire monster pool at the time with their search effects. Witch of the Black Forest specifically could search out all of a Summon Skull Beatdown deck's important monsters, as all of the strongest monsters had less than 1500 defense, and so did smaller flip monsters like Man Eater Bug. Magician of Faith, on the other hand, would seem more limited limited usage as spells had not yet become the dominant factor in the game. Tribute to the Doom was also a very widely used card from Metal Raiders at the time, as it was the first card in the game that allowed for targeted monster destruction in spell form. Heavy Storm and Mirror Force also got the release in Metal Raiders, both of which landed on the limited list soon after. The third set of 2002, Magic Ruler, later renamed to Spell Ruler due to a conflicting thing with Magic the Gathering, also brought its own suite of powerful cards that would change the game. While it introduced a wide range of powerful spell cards, there were a few of these that had standard usage in the beatdown decks at the time. The only card from Magic Ruler I will go over in regards to the Summon Skull beatdown deck is Axe of Despair. Now, Axe of Despair was the first equipped spell in the game that didn't have tremendous drawbacks while simultaneously granting a significant bonus to the equipped monster, making it so that non-tribute monsters like La Jin could beat out Summon Skull. This was the first true paradigm shift in the strategy strategy of beatdown, as Summon Skull can now be dethroned without having to use destruction cards such as Fissure or Raigeki. The final set of 2002 was Pharaoh's Servant, a set that introduced only a handful of essential cards from most beatdown decks. On the monster side of things, the set introduced Goblin Attack Force, a card with 2300 attack that could be summoned without a tribute. While it did have a drawback, the card was indicative of the attack point power creep that started rapidly occurring in 2002 and early 2003. The other main monster from the set was Jinzo, a monster that stopped all traps. As the game had continued to grow more and more trap heavy throughout its first year, a card like Jinzo was extremely relevant. Beyond these two monsters, Pharaoh's Servant also introduced Imperial Order, a continuous trap that negated all spell effects and could be destroyed almost at will. The combination of Jinzo and Imperial Order, despite both of them being limited to one almost immediately upon the release, allowed the more monster-heavy focus of Beatdown to continue to stay relevant into the upcoming format of extremely powerful game changing spells. However, while it would remain in the meta, the next two booster sets would radically alter the cards that beatdown decks would use. Even though the first year of the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG saw a whirlwind of extremely powerful spells and traps get released, the humble Summon Skull beatdown deck remained relatively unchanged after Metal Raiders aside from a small handful of cards. However, the release of the Labyrinth of Nightmare, the first booster set of 2003, would change the base of beatdown radically. While previous sets had introduced more powerful monsters, they all had drawbacks to their power in the form of life point cost, switching to defense position or being tribute monsters. Labyrinth of Nightmare brought about the first objective wide-scale power creep of the monster pool in the game's history. The power creep was mainly centered around three monsters, Gemini Elf, Bazu the Soul Eater, and Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer. First off, there's Gemini Elf. At first, it seems to be yet another step in the escalation of level 4 normal monsters following Mechanical Chaser. However, Gemini Elf is more notable than Mechanical Chaser because it was both more widely available than Chaser was at the time, and Gemini Elf heralded the end of the attack point power creep until Gene Warp Werewolf was released four years later, far past the point where such monsters were relevant to the metagame. Next was Bazu the Soul Eater. Now, Bazu is an interesting card, as it was particularly powerful in the TCG upon its initial release due to a faulty translation. While his effect is supposed to allow the player to banish up to three monsters from the graveyard to give Bazu 300 attack for each monster banished this way, the original text allowed for the banishing of any card. This was especially relevant at the time, as the only method for recycling spells or traps was Magician of Faith and Mask of Darkness respectively, making these otherwise dead cards in the grave useful for something. Even after his text was fixed, Bazu still remained a very notable card. Though it came at a cost, Bazu was the first card that could be normal summoned and have comparable attack to Summon Skull, the previous benchmark for a high attack. This made Summon Skull considerably less popular as Bazu was often the better choice due to his versatility and level 4 status. Finally, Labyrinth of Nightmare brought Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer into the game. While the previous two cards demonstrated distinct power creep in terms of sheer attacking power, Kaiku was the start of a much larger trend that would define the game going forward. Powerful Effect Monsters Up to this point, most effect monsters were either slow, flip effect monsters, 
weak monsters with extremely situational effects, or monsters whose only effects were simply conditions and drawbacks on their attack power. Kaiku departed from this trend by being a monster with 1800 attack, the previous high benchmark for common play, but also carried a useful effect along with that attack score. This combination made Kaiku an extremely popular choice in many decks of the day, and would only become more popular in future formats where the graveyard held greater importance. Beyond these three monsters, Labyrinth of Nightmare brought two new equip spells into the fray, United We Stand and Mage Power. These two cards were a significant leap from Axe of Despair's 1000 attack point boost, allowing for almost any monster to beat any other monster in attack with the right field setup, something unheard of before this point. With these powerful new additions, the Gemini Elf version of Beatdown still focused largely on getting out extremely powerful monsters and using them to quickly defeat their opponent. However, players of the deck started to include more emphasis on spells and traps that would allow them to control the game state better outside of just using monsters. It was also around this time that Beatdown started to really become distinct from the other major deck of the format, Hand Control. While Beatdown was definitely still a powerhouse deck and extremely common, Hand Control's greater focus on card advantage and maintaining field presence over sheer attack power would push Beatdown further in the overall metagame that was just beginning to develop at the time. As 2003 went on and more sets were released, each with its own set of extremely powerful effect monsters, the emerging higher levels of play in the TCG would continue to move further and further away from beatdown as a viable strategy, instead favoring decks that could control the opponent's resources or pull off powerful combos to win the game. The true nail in the coffin to beat down as a meta deck was the release of Invasion of Chaos in early 2004, a retrospective that is also on the channel that you can go and check out, and that will be a shameless plug. This set released the infamous Chaos Monsters, which would form the basis of the meta for the next two years. Because Chaos Sticks required a specific balancing of light and dark monsters, Beatdown's focus on equip spells and high attack points really fell behind. In spite of this, Beatdown would remain a popular and semi-viable deck type at local tournaments until the release of Competitive Archetypes in 2008 spelled the end for directionless decks like Beatdown. Due to the nature of power creep, the banning of most of the key power cards from the early game, and the progression of the game overall, Beatdown has no real viability or place in the modern game of Yu-Gi-Oh! I hope you enjoyed this video and definitely let me know in the comments below if you want me to cover hand control which was more in the 2003 era. I feel like overall this time in Yu-Gi-Oh! is just so different and such a far cry from what we had in the game originally that I thought it would be fun to cover. So thank you so much for tuning in to this retrospective. I hope that you enjoyed. Let me know down in the comments if there's something else you'd rather me cover instead of 2003 hand control or if there's a format that you think would be good. Just let me know in the comments below. I love reading the comments in these retrospectives. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.